Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day they used to be Sitting there with magic potions, destroying me, friends, stealing his world. And hello to everybody out there at People's Internet Radio, and we've got Jimmy Hagen here, and I've got Sean McGee with me as well, and uh, this is European News Weekly. We're back again for yet another jam-packed week. Uh, hello, Sean, and hi again. Ah, oh, Jimmy, it uh, seems like uh, it's been a whole week since I last saw you, but I think it was only five minutes, so... Um... It, it's more, it's, <laughs> it feels like it's been a, a week-long Skype call, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, true. All right, look, I'm going to get straight into this because we have no extra time uh, at all. So, uh, right, welcome to European News Weekly. As I said, people, we've uh, got this great show lined up today. Uh, we've got three hours of podcasts, and we're basically going to start off. Uh, we'll be having Wayne Jones on um, uh, in the near future. Uh, he's an anti-nuclear campaigner, and he's going to be talking to us on European uh, nuclear news relevant stuff. Um, we've got, in the second hour, we have uh, Candice Paul, uh, First Nations from the Dene tribe, uh, discussing the uh, fires that happened in Canada. And uh, then basically we have, uh, and, and she has some great testimony, I have to say, please, please, please watch this. Uh, there are articles out there that give you details about these fires and looking at climate change, but impact on people, that's what we want to know. And Candice delivered that uh, very succinctly. Um, the, uh, then we've got Kevin in that same second hour, who will be coming uh, into uh, basically, uh, us with the uh, extinction report. Um, we'll be discussing uh, droughts and fires and uh, the more technical aspects of what's going on. Um, with a bit of luck, uh, we're, yes, then we're going to go straight into the next show. Uh, and uh, we start that one off with uh, John Lannan, who we've had on before. Uh, he'll be talking about the protest uh, that was well publicized in uh, Shannon Airport, uh, which was against the uh, use of Shannon Airport as a US military base. Uh, they had an air show there. 30 thousand people went by and John Lennon can tell you uh, the kind of response he got it was generally a very good one uh, because uh, obviously a lot of Irish people are not uh, warlike in their in their uh, perspective. Uh, he also discusses with us uh, something about the Shell Oil campaign and how plowshares uh, uh, sort of broke some of the, uh, uh, the sort of barriers down uh, for activists uh, when the government are using uh, uh, sort of the courts to uh, punish activists for their uh, peaceful and uh, democratically uh, allowable uh, protests. Um, and of course, uh, we'll, I'll just go on to uh, Donald O'Kelly. Um, and he uh, was actually in the Shell uh, court case in Castle Bar in Ireland, where a great landmark uh, 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 sort of uh, judgment was made. On you know, you know, for the protesters, allowing them to make actions uh, to protest against things that could be illegal or un uh, unecological or a number of things. So uh, Donald O'Kelly fills us in with that, and he also fills us in with the Gaza, uh, basically the Gaza uh, installation that was in Dublin, um, and we're going to get him to talk about that as well. Uh, then we've got Jerry. Um, Sorry, what's the surname? I've forgotten Jerry Burke. It. Uh, Jerry Burke. Jerry Burke. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, but Jerry Burke, who basically uh, has come in. We had a very bad phone call, but we've uh, managed to get the information out of that, and we'll uh, we'll fill you in with that. And you can hear Jerry in his own words, just sort of telling us uh, the sort of things that he's had to deal with with security companies um, and uh, many other things. So uh, Jerry's uh, he's got out now. He's uh, he's a free man. He was doing his democratically right right uh, right of protest and. Uh, that's been uh, assessed by a jury, and uh, well done, Jerry and uh, Liam, also who was involved. Uh, the surname of Liam again, uh, Liam Heffernan. Heffernan, that's it, exactly so. Sorry. Yeah. Um, anyway, so then we have uh, Stephen Manning on, uh, who's also going to uh, be talking to us about some uh, justice issues. He'll be uh, discussing his uh, vexatious, vexatious charges 
um, and the court case that was uh, that resulted from that on the 15th of July um, so and he's also giving us a Joe Ducey uh, update um, I would also say uh, yeah I would say that's that's basically it then we're going to um, basically I just want a quick heads up to 60 Minutes in Australia, who have got a special investigation called Spies, Lords and Predators. Um, now, if you go to find this, um, it's well worth watching. It's a dramatic testimony of uh, sex abuse and uh, uh, the UK, uh, should we say, um, uh, government being involved directly uh, with the abuse of children or some people in that uh, area. Uh, now, first off, we're going to kick off uh, really with... Well, let's uh, not Donald forget, you, you forgot one thing there. What was that? You forgot the very final one. We've got testimony from uh, Ashleen Lowe uh, concerning uh, the... Oh, uh, the, oh, heavens. Oh, no, yeah, right. Concerning Sorry, the action you. of... Uh, have you got some written down uh, there uh, for... Yeah, yeah, no, totally. Well, uh, Ashleen Lowe, uh, Tony Rochford is per at the moment. Uh, he, he was uh, protesting at, in Dublin uh, at Phoenix Park. Um, he was removed. Uh, he's on a hunger strike and he's on a wet hunger strike at the moment. Um, so basically, we'll be uh, talking a little bit about more about that, and we'll also be talking with Ashling Rowe, who basically uh, who basically uh, is a friend um, and also uh, a supporter. And he, she she is basically uh, she was with his wife, and they they were telling us basically, or she specifically was telling us uh, the situation with Tony, uh, who's got very ill uh, today, and uh, basically. Um, yeah, we, we've got that, uh, that that story and, uh, you know, how to contact and get updates on it. And uh, it's to do with uh, basically he's be, he's um, uh, he's basically doing a, a health activist. So, uh, you know, he, he's uh, he's been stopped and blocked uh, all the way uh, from his uh, from getting his information out. And uh, this is kind of a last resort. So, all right, okay. With that, I'm just going to straight away get into John Tal uh, the John Dawn Charlton expose uh, of the BP B the British National Party far right party in the UK, uh, where she is uh, given testimony, amazing testimony about the uh, illegality and the uh, goings on behind the British National Party and uh, the politics behind it all as well. Um, so, uh, I, I think Jimmy, I think we've uh, Covered that. Oh, I should say that the uh, the Dawn Charlton expose is uh, we've basically taken this from the Hope Not Hate on YouTube, and you can find them at hopenothate.org.uk, and you can get the full video there. And we've posted it also on europeannewsweekly.wordpress.com uh, with links to uh, Hope Not Hate uh, website. So uh, hopefully this this information should get around. Uh, download the video if you can. Uh, as well, because uh, these things sometimes uh, get taken down. Okay, so um, Jimmy, uh, should we get started with uh, with Dawn's uh, testimony first? Uh, from Indeed. Who, who was working in the BMP and left and has uh, decided to spill the beans? You've been working with the party for how many years now? It must be four, what, four years, four and a half years. About oh, four years yeah. in, in head office. Yes, I have. Yeah. Plodding away and uh, working really, really hard. And every minute of you. Well, of course, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you're <laughs> the voice of the party, aren't you? How would you describe the way that the BNP head office is run? It's fil well, it's filthy, for starters, because there was only me that used to clean up. Like, when deliveries used to come, I was embarrassed of how, you know, dirty and smelly that it was. Um, the dr there's drug abuse in that office, which I've witnessed many a time, many a time, in the toilet and on the desk. It's quite an open secret that there is drug abuse in the BNP. Yes, there is. Where, where else would? Well, it doesn't just stop at head office. It goes to conferences, Blackpool especially. The use of drugs? Yeah, yeah. What sort of drugs? Cocaine. I've seen it. I know that an official bought his car with money from drugs. Proceeds of drugs? Yes, from right. proceeds That's of drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's an open secret in the BMW? Yeah, yes it is. And I would go to any court and say that. And name names? And name names, yeah. Throughout its 33-year history, the BNP has been driven by paranoia and fear. In 2010, by bugging phones and installing listening devices, the paranoid BNP uncovered what they thought was a plot to kill their leader. The BNP continues to eavesdrop on their members and officials. Yeah, I do know, and it's fact, that they have um, been into people's emails, um, party emails especially, because um, they like to see who's on board and who's not on board. And the people that's not on board, they do get, you know, removed from their position. 
they do hack um sorry they do clone mobile phones um because they like to you know um intimidate other people like peter malloy and wind them up and send them messages and i think jefferson had about four or five phones in his possession Allegations of corruption marred much of Nick Griffin's 14-year period as the most successful far-right leader in British history. In 2014, voted out of his European seat, certain members of the BNP decided it was time for Griffin to go. Clive Jefferson, also known as Aitken, rose to be the party treasurer after a series of internal splits took him from being Nick Griffin's bodyguard to the de facto leader and owner of the party. Adam Walker was a down at hill school teacher facing the sack from his role as a researcher on the BMP's European team. How did they get rid of Nick Griffin? Yeah, well, because Clive Jefferson, he, he um, organised all this. He wanted Nick Griffin out. Um, he rang round all the ROs and, you know, told lies. That's the regional organiser. Yeah, 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 told lies to them all. And I mean, he even flew someone in from Vienna so that he could vote actually against Nick. There was three people in the meeting at Lutterworth who didn't want Nick to go, but everybody else was groomed before they went into the meeting. So it, it was all rigged before Nick got there, and, and Nick Griffin didn't know what he was walking into. When they did get rid of Nick, um, a lot of people left the party. And a lot of people uh, were expelled from the party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did have members that, you know, weren't happy, and Clive Jefferson told us to say to members on the phone, you know, well, Nick wanted to go, he wanted to move on, and he would only hand it over to Adam, which was a lie. Is the next BNP leadership election in 2015 this year, mm -hmm. is that going to be a fair election? Definitely not. Definitely not. None of the ROs or the organisers have had any updates from head office for months and months and months. So they don't know how many members they've got in each, each region. But the way Jack, uh, Clive Jefferson's told me that he's going to add on extra people onto the family membership. So he's getting four votes out of each house instead of the one vote, which will all go for Adam Walker. Because he picked Adam Walker because he can control him. And if he gives him £10, he will do backflips for him. He's so greedy. He's the greediest person I've ever met in my life. Despite being a very small party, the BNP has always had enough money to buy off those it could not intimidate. <clears throat> um, the party legal team um, consists of Patrick Harriton and Graham Williamson. Um, they do, um, you know, dealings with, you know, people who um, have had, like, had the sack or, or have left and they paid money to keep their mouths shut. But oh, yes. I've heard conversations of these people with Clive Jefferson and Clive Jefferson instructing Graham um, as to what to say and how much to buy people off for. Do you know any members of the party that have been bought off to keep their mouths shut? Well, there's, there's, there's quite a few actually. I mean, Mark Walker, Adam Walker's brother, he was bought off for £2,000. And going by Adam's talk, um, he had every job in the party and he was useless. When people call head office, you know, to make a donation or to renew the membership, um, they're asked by David O'Loughlin, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, leaving a legacy to the party, for which every um, will he gets, he then passes on to Clive Jefferson. He'll go and travel down the country and get the will, and in return, David O'Loughlin gets a £100 commission for every will that he signs up. And who, who is the executor of these wills? Clive Jefferson's on most of the wills as executor um, because he, he, t he tells me that, you know, they'll never get rid of me from the party and if they do, it doesn't matter because I'm executor on all the wills and the wills will come with me. Could you elaborate on wills and the little process uh, surrounding the wills and how they work? Wills are never an agreement between me and the person. There is no will I've ever written or had written or been a part of there's an agreement between me and the person. Mm. My agreement is agent. I'm providing a service, and it's not an easy service either. Mm. Being an executor, it's a very big responsibility, but I'm legally bound to carry out that person's wishes. We had a gentleman who was a member. <clears throat> um, he left a, um, a, a huge will. Um, and we had his wife writing letters to Clive Jefferson asking for a share of the will, which, you know, she was entitled to, she was promised. And as far as I know, till today, she hasn't received any money. How much money is projected as future income for the BNP that Clive Jefferson is the executor of? Millions. One million, two million, three million? Could be two, three million. Two or three million pounds? Easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's wills there where people have left the homes 
and that the homes could sell for over £200,000 each, £250,000 each, that's without all the assets and everything else they've got. If you've left money to the BNP, I think I will go and change my will. I, I will really go and change my will because they're just going to sit it with the inner pot and it's their pension. As a BNP activist, Dawn was arrested three times. The BNP has never had a problem with its members engaging in alleged criminal behaviour. Clive Jefferson um, made appeals, Adam Walker made appeals um, to raise money for me to get a really good party solicitor to help pay and I got legal aid. So at no stage did the BNP hire you legal representation? No they didn't, no, no. I got legal aid. But the BNP ran a campaign to Yes, get you... they, they ran a few, yeah, yeah. The BNP often runs anti-paedophile campaigns to keep them popular and in the public eye. They have a Labour 25 campaign booklet um, and on the back of it it states that 50% goes to the NSP says they don't get a penny, nothing is donated to, not donated to them, nothing, not a penny. Dawn, some people will say what you're telling us is because your relationship with Clive Jefferson ended and that you're bitter and twisted about it. No, well, that's rubbish. Um, the, the reason they sacked me is because I was asking where all the money had gone, um, all the donations, all the memberships of the um, the direct debit, um, because I wanted my wages and I have a loan, I lent them a loan at Christmas and I was wanting my money back and I was told that there was no money, when I knew in fact there was plenty of money had been coming through the central office. It has been alleged that there was violence in your relationship? Yes there was. Yes, there was. I think that's what sort of brought it to a head. Um, we had like a few arguments and we were driving home from work one night um, from Wickton through Aspatria and he dragged me out of the car and threw me down in the road. Now, that's a very serious allegation to make. Well, you can check with the police. Hmm. Now then, Sean. Stunning, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I have to say, I have to say that uh, before the Anders Breivik uh, murders of children in, uh, in Norway, <clears throat> The, was it, one of the chief officers in the National Domestic Extremist Intelligence Unit, uh, who are connected to MI5 and spy on protesters, they basically said that they weren't interested in the uh, far-right uh, par uh, parties. And of course, in, uh, as uh, we found out about Brevik, that it was English and European far-right uh, organizations that were egging him on to do what he did. So uh, uh, that, that uh, they then became, afterwards, they were supposed to be under surveillance, uh, and we find out that they're cloning phones and doing all the things that uh, the surveillance guys do. Um, we have to say, well, how do they know that? And why weren't they nicked for all these uh, criminality that went on? But that's my own opinion. Hmm. It's, it's just like uh, it's just given us a little bit of an insight into how all parties uh, effectively operate. Uh, well, that would be uh, one question I'd I'd like to put to uh, to the lady in question, uh, Dawn. Is this? Well, the big thing is is that the reason they're not being uh, arrested is because they're being used by security services mm. and probably being let off their uh, criminality. Yeah, it's quite amazing. That's a big statement, a sweeping statement, I realise, but anyway, I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> right, so uh, that was a good find, Sean. Well done. Okay, and that came out yesterday, and as I, I gave him the, de give him the details, and go to European News Weekly for the links, the, vid the full video, and, uh, and uh, well done to the Hope Not Hate team. Well done. Right, I suppose now we'll go on to uh, change the pace a little bit. We're going to have a chat with uh, Wayne Jones, who's over in Ireland at the moment. Uh, he's uh, He was from Wales, and, uh, well, we, we do all the explanation in the podcast that we recorded uh, last night. So uh, if you could uh, lead off with that, Jimmy. Sure thing, Sean. And uh, now we'd like to welcome on European News Weekly, uh, uh, we'd like to welcome Wayne Jones. He's been uh, 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 sort of an activist uh, and uh researcher uh, in nuclear matters um, and he's been doing this for 25 years. Um, he was in Wales, uh, he's now uh, come over to Ireland and uh, doing some various projects over here and uh, elsewhere as well. He's uh, been uh, very involved, he has uh, websites and Facebook, so, uh, but what I'll do is I'll uh, bring him in now and uh, he'll be able to uh, introduce, uh, well, be able to sort of say hello to us all and uh, I think we've got some questions lined up um, uh, to ask, so uh, uh, welcome to the show uh, Wayne, it's uh, very good to have you here. 
it's good to be here, Sean. Excellent. Well, uh, well, might as well get cracking with the interviews uh, uh, questions. So uh, I, I suppose I'd like to say, like, you know, when did you start opposing nuclear power? What was your raison d'etre? Uh, and, uh, and what kind of uh, activities uh, did you uh, participate in? Well, I, I've been involved in kind of environmentalism since 1972, and uh, I self-educated myself, uh, mainly from university textbooks of the new ecology courses that had started to appear, particularly in the United States. Um, I was very influenced by Edward Goldsmith's book. Uh, he's the ecologist magazine's editor, and he brought out a book called The Blueprint for Survival, and um, that helped. Uh, I just, I, I, I've been helping insulate losses to the fence of the earth under the liberal li 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 light a liberal labor government um, free insulation scheme in the 70s uh, where they they gave free insulation to pe people who were um, you know single parent and were uh, pensioners that scheme didn't really kick in until the Tories had gone into power but it was brought in under that particular form of, of Calaman's government in in the, the late 70s then after 1979 um, the conservative government brought out uh, its white paper nuclear power I bought a copy of it and beca that became the basis of my opposition nuclear power because I just didn't want nuclear power anymore because of the wind scale issue. Um, me and my lady were avid Guardian readers, being very left wing at the time, and the uh, precise all inquiry debate into reactor choice was massive in the Guardian with experts on all sides of the debate filling the paper every day. And I used to cut out all the articles and keep them and read them. Um, in 1982, I became secretary of the local campaign for nuclear disarmament group. And through Essex CND, that I was also active with, I became involved in the March for a Safe Future, the London to Sizewall March uh, against Sizewall B nuclear power station. I eventually attended the inquiry as a member of the Sizewall Nonviolent Action Group, which was formed to do to, to, to actions and awareness uh, raising and uh, theatrical um, events in, for, the, for, the, for the press and the local people um, at the size of inquiry. But then I went on to get involved in the actual proceedings because the, the objective presence was very, very small there. Um, I, I used the objection of the Ipswich CND chairman, a guy called Richard Stern, and I had help from a guy called Jeff Young who produced the nuclear waste dumping newsletter in presenting evidence on nuclear waste disposal. After that, I was asked by a Cumbrian activist, particularly Jean Emery and her friends from Cumbrian Post to Radioactive Environment, to help them. And so I also ended up cross-examining British Nuclear Fuels Limited experts and witnesses and uh, government witnesses on reprocessing at the size of an inquiry. And it was successes in, in this that led me to eventually become involved with the Welsh Anti-Nuclear Alliance, with whom I was active from 1984 to 1998. Oh, that's very, very. Uh, that's a very, very colourful uh, history there, Wayne. And uh, so, w what have you been involved in then since you've come over here to Ireland? Then, well, um, I had a bit of time off after 1998 when I came to Ireland, and uh, I wasn't active. I'd been doing a lot of stuff, and I thought it was time to leave it out of it. I, you know, I don't want to create a vacuum behind me. And uh, but when the Fukushima thing sort of happened, uh, it was the government responses to Fukushima that was that I was quite appalled by the lack of information that was coming out at that time. You know, in 2011, at that time in March, there was uh, I'd been doing a, a, a course in uh, media philosophy, and I had television for once. It don't often have television, don't now, but then I had to study the different news channels. So I had a lot of news from all around the world and I was comparing, you know, for the college course, the, the, the angles that different countries and news programs were bringing out. So I was in a very good position to look at the way the media responded to Fukushima. And, you know, they, they, they were holding back a lot. Of, all the information was being held back and uh, this was um, obviously something that I could do something about because I had actually been uh, held the Warner office in my flat at the time at Chernobyl and was one of the team that responded to the public in Wales. Nobody else did at the time, but it was a Chernobyl incident. So I was well aware of the issues in, um, in, in emergency planning, uh, uh, well, emergency lack of planning. Okay? And um, the response of the Irish government seemed that, they, to me, they weren't really given any information out to, to national Irish nationals that might be in the area at the time. And um, obviously, somebody with my experience in, in, in knowledge of, of uh, nuclear um, nuclear technology. I knew straight away what was going to happen there but with, in, a, in a shutdown situation without the reactor decay heat being dispersed. They were going to melt. They were all going to melt and it would just be slower than a full meltdown in, in, in full operation. But no one was saying that. But there must have been a lot of people who knew that. I mean, I'm not the only person who knows that's the case. 
so they were actually holding that information away from people on purpose. And that's what got me involved in talking to the Radiological Protection Institute of Ireland to find out why they weren't doing anything um, to, to alert Irish people to what the dangers were, were there. Whose attitude actually was, and this is part of the protocol that you find in, in nuclear power politics now, was well, their attitude was only the Japanese Ministry of Health were allowed to give anything. Even the International Atomic Energy Authority our agents, according to them, weren't the proper authority to be telling people. And of course, as we know, the Japanese Ministry of Health were not being straight. So, you know, the RPII let down the Irish people there. And that's how I started getting involved in, in Ireland, um, by lobbying the RPII to actually say something to Irish people out there. And um, after that, I noticed that at the same time, you had this new directive coming in, in Europe, which had, um, which was Pat Hogan, the Minister for the Environment, was at the sign in 2013. And um, the EU directed 2011-70 on nuclear, on high, highly active waste was um, actually a big step because um, you know there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of laws around saying until nuclear waste is sorted it out then we can't really um, start building new nuclear programs and there was no basis for, in law for building a nuclear program in Britain so this directive was a sidestep by the British government and uh, the right wing government in Europe to get away from those stipulations put on them to not start building programs until they buried them, did something with the waste and um, so that that sort of got me very interested then, because nuclear waste is my subject, and I started lobbying people in Ireland on the directive, and I was saying, under this directive, there's nothing to stop nuclear waste coming into Ireland. No one would agree with me, and actually, I couldn't get anybody anywhere to do anything about it, which I'm very sad about, because it altered the whole position. It gave them the legal basis to build the new program in Britain, and um, but people in Ireland just couldn't believe that the nuclear waste could come in. Now, I still think that the directive has, has given that. Um, I'll go on about that and answer later. And uh, that's really what got me involved. So I was talking to the Galway Alliance Against War on the directive in, in a meeting up there. And uh, since then, I was lobbying various newspapers and things. But no one would believe me. So, you know, that, that's, a, that's how I got back into the scene in Ireland anyway. Thank you very much. That's a great answer. Sean, do we not have Sean on the line still? Are you still there anyway, Wayne? I'm here, yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, am I back? <laughs> yeah, you are, yeah, you're back. Sorry about that. Um, all right, slight technical hitch. Um, I was going to say that um, the question I'd um, I'd basically want to put to you now. I mean, there was a, a, a green paper in Ireland uh, which was positing the fact that maybe nuclear power could be a, a possibility, um, and uh, I think there's a, a deadline if uh, one wants to challenge uh, that particular um, part of paper. Uh, but um, what what do you, do you think the chances are of uh, nuclear power coming to Ireland? Well, the, the first um, the first uh, thing that I saw on the idea that Money Point might be a place that you could uh, put a nuclear power station that was put forward by a guy called Tom Flaherty. Tom Flaherty, who is the the Irish representative to the uh, technical scientific and technical committee of Euratom. He's, um, he was the, they're the people that drew up the waste directive. Um, he was also, he's also the next CEO of the Radiological Protection Institute of Ireland. And he is part of this pro-nuclear Irish organization. And, but he also advises the government here. So you can see that the advice in the Irish government is definitely pro-nuclear. Start. And, uh, and, um, you can see his handiwork through a lot of things. And I, I, he was the first person that I saw mention Money Point in that, in, 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 in something that was on the web there that he's saying. And of course, after that, it came up in this green paper where, where the idea of, uh, of testing the water to see if the Irish public would accept nuclear was put forward in the green paper. That's exactly what it said. But uh, in Ra Rabbit's green paper, it, it, they also said that, you know, nuclear power stations are far too big for the Irish grid. You know, it wouldn't, they wouldn't really be able to incorporate them. But I, I don't really see that because the, the repla a replacement money point would only be the same as, say, an ATR 600. That's not the size of Westinghouse reactors that, like you see in being built in, in, in Britain, which are APR 1000, but they are smaller ones and they, they would fit the bill, especially if there was storage put on the grid, which is uh, one of the ways in which uh, nuclear power is, is, is run in Britain. You know, they've got some storage scheme um, in relation to the, the nuclear power station over there. And uh, so, so there is a possibility. But what, what actually, what actually crystallizes it for me, you've got to remember that nuclear is an industry that competes for business. And there's absolutely no way 
at the likes of Western Mouth aren't going to look at Ireland and wonder if they can sell nuclear power here. Of course they'd like to sell nuclear power and increase their market. And when you look at the Shannon, I mean, there's a very big river there that they could like nuclear power stations on. Not just at Money Point, but if you look at the Shannon, yes, you've got plenty of cooling water coming out of that river system. And there's plenty of reasons to believe that they might want to be moving up into the rivers because a huge increase in cost of nuclear power at the moment has come through work associated with sea defense because of the Fukushima accident. And if they move in land and up river systems, obviously they're avoiding those costs. So yeah, there, there, is, there is a reason to be concerned. Like I said, the two points, main points are people advising the Irish government are all pro-nuclear pro and the nuclear industry would obviously like to move in where they can see a situation to their advantage. And Ireland in the channel has certainly got that. Also, with the nuclear waste directive, there's a good case. Good, I, I can see a reason why nuclear waste could come to Ireland, and that's because in the directive, there's nothing in the directive to say that somebody in Ireland, maybe a poor land sitting on, say, granite, couldn't take the money. You remember, 40 million is being offered to the community to take nuclear waste repository in Britain. There's no reason why someone shouldn't volunteer and say to take the money. Now, the directive, which was signed into law in 2000, in August 2013 by Hogan, has to have set up the idea of an independent authorizing authority. I can't see anywhere in the directive where the government has the right to say no to the waste coming in. The only thing that in any directive that gives the power to the Irish government to say no to nuclear waste is in the previous directive, which will allow them to stop it being imported. Now remember, this has been signed into law in Ireland by Hogan. So it is now Irish law. So I can foresee a situation where a private individual to put their hand up and say, oh, well, come and bear it here. You know, we'll take the money. And then uh, mm. the authorizers are nothing to do with the government. They are, they're going to say, well, yes, it's a possibility he could do that. He could do that. And then the only thing the Irish government will be able to say, well, we're not allowed to import it. Just remember that all of Ireland's exports go through either France or Britain. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're borrowing money from these places. So they're hardly in a very good position to say no if the, the search for, for sites specific doesn't actually come to anything in Britain. And there's a very good reason to believe that it wouldn't. You know. So yeah, there is a legal basis by where, by where somebody in Ireland could actually volunteer to take the way. So I think the government here would be in a very big, difficult position because of the directive. That's my thinking on you know, the problems that, that will face Ireland in the future. Oh, and that, that, that's a scary thought, Wayne, uh, to, because we do know that there's issues with, you, with, with nuclear waste and because they don't know what to do with it. Like, up a bit there. Oh, I'm Hello. sorry. Um, it's, it's, it's a scary thought, Wayne, that uh, because, because we know there's issues around uh, nuclear waste and they don't know what to do with it, um, the, the, the thoughts of waste being brought here to this country to be dumped, uh, that's really scary, I have to say that. Um, yeah, well, look, underneath the directive, the Irish, the, the Irish, the Irish will not be have to take spent fuel at all. But there's nothing to stop other forms of waste that have been processed. Mm. You know, the director said it's now illegal to export it and yes. import it. Okay. So, Wayne, um, do you have any hope that we can avoid another Chernobyl here in Europe? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we've come very close, you know. I mean, but it's been going on in Ukraine. Firstly, I mean, it's the first time there's ever been a war in a, a nuclear power zone. You know, 16 operating new reactors in, in Ukraine, and uh, I, I don't know of any single incidents where there's been a war situation. I mean, it was avoided in, in the uh, Yugoslavia conflict. You remember that in um, Slovenia, the whole Slovenia thing kicked off and then stopped very, very quickly. And that's where the two Yugoslav reactors were. So, like, the war scene was moved away to where the superpowers didn't mind it being. And as soon as it started coming down south towards Kosovo and in there and towards Macedonia, you now in Bulgaria, they got operating reactors. And they kind of knocked it on the head when it got down there. You know, but with this Ukraine thing going on now, I mean, I mean, it's the closest we've come in a long time. Now, NATO actually encouraged bombing by, 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 by supporting Ukraine in its bombing of eastern Ukraine. The three planes were shot down during that time, and that's just unacceptable where there's nuclear reactors operating. These are, some of them are Chernobyl kind of reactors. They're very big reactors. And, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, now, and I will be lobbying on this as an integral part of the anti-Wilder B campaign on Anglesey, that war is 
part of the risk to nuclear power. And we want to know what the risk is. Is there, is there anyone that could suggest that weapons of war and nuclear power can coexist in the same space? I don't believe they can. And, you know, we've, we've come to the edge. The, the legacy of, of Chernobyl in, in North Wales is still there with the, the hill farmers, the sheep farmers. You know, there's still, there's still activity, um, cesium in those hills. And if, if it happened again, then you might as well abandon, you know, Snowdonia and North Wales hill farmers.